would have voted yes on the Southern Oregon area driver. Gary Springer, Board of Court Steve Wilson, Board of Court I'm John Black, Alberta Park uh, Dan Postrell, Department of Forestry. Brad Knott, Department of Forestry. Kevin Coleman. And, and he's a, a person that's been very much affected by aerial spray, has damaged his grape crops, and he's involved with a court trial out in Roseburg. And his expert uh, agronomist <coughs> is going to be our keynote uh, presenter today. Uh, back here. David Lorenz, Department of Forestry. Okay, and uh, here he is, our uh, keynote presenter today, Stu Turner. And in a few minutes, as you see on your agenda, uh, he's going to, before we take off on this ground tour, he's going to give his background, uh, which will thoroughly impress you, I promise. We're also going to have a bit of video shoot um, about one of the spots that we're going to go see on the ground tour. Uh, today you'll see it with clean water flowing, but you're going to see uh, some dirty water flowing into some clean water, and when Erin uh, leads you up there on that leg of the journey, she's going to explain why she thinks that happened, and we'll consider some solutions. Um, I want to begin by saying that uh, number one, Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thanks for being here. I'm not, did everybody introduce themselves? I think we heard. Well, 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 we heard what we would consider all of you, you know, official agency type folks. But it's fine for us, anybody uh, that feels like sharing who they are that didn't get a chance to do that yet. I'm Justin Workman, local resident. Sorry, Aaron King. I'm Gary Hale, local resident. I'm Shannon And we did not advertise this event. We did not activate our phone list or mailing list or anything like that. We wanted to keep it sort of business meeting format. And uh, because of our agenda uh, and being pressed for time, I'm going to go ahead and get rolling here. I'm going to pass out now. And so uh, anybody who's able to assist on this, let's make sure all of our guests. This is a sheet of paper which explains two specific things that we're actually going to ask you to do. Those of you that are members of the Board of Forestry or the Oregon Department of Forestry in regards to your experience today. Uh, one, in regards to the stop off of Fish Creek where Aaron will be actually showing you where the dirty water was flowing into the clean water, uh, we're going to ask, A, did a violation of the Clean Water Act or other law or policy take place when the large amount of sediment entered the water, causing sky-high sediment readings, readings that were confirmed by the DEQ when they came out a couple days later, even though the numbers had gone down a couple days later, uh, they were still sky high. Now if so, that's B, were any fines or other penalties dished out? And C, if a violation occurred and no penalties were dished out, why? So the first question is, we residents who see, as you're about to see, filthy sediment-filled water streaming into a crystal clear creek that is the headwaters of a salmon-bearing coho-protected creek. When we see that happen, and we know that there are laws related to the Clean Water Act that have been adopted in the state of Oregon that have to do with the amount of sediment <coughs> that can enter the water, we want to know what well, in an instance like that where you have this huge discharge into a salmon bearing headwaters, is that a violation? If it's not a violation, why isn't it a, a violation? Should it be a violation? If in fact it is a violation, in this case, were any penalties meted out? We want to know that and we're going to ask you guys to give us your considered viewpoint on that. We realize that you probably have to 
take what you see today, go back and do some investigation on your own part. Now, number two, another stop you're going to see today. When we pull over at this place, an uh, infamous place where I shattered my elbow and many people have done worse than that called the rock slides, where actually you get out there on your rear end and slide down a, a sheet of rock in the water. Uh, it's kind of a tourist attraction here on Highway 36. When we park there, we're going to be looking at something that we, you know, just lay persons would think at least might have been a violation, and what it is, is you're going to see a sheer mountainside that Stu's good at saying what percent slant something is. It's basically straight up and down. It was clear cut. The folks that live around the lake say they saw helicopters, aerial spray there, but I didn't. So what I'm going to want to know is can um, the ODF, can Dave, for example, being the ODF fan for this region, can he pull up a file and a, confirm whether or not the local folks are right that that steep uh, mountainside was aerial spray? Because if it was, if local folks are right about that, right at the base of that is a uh, riparian zone there's a fish ladder there. The salmon pass through right there, the protected coho. And as a layperson, and you're going to see it with your own eyes, I can't see how it could be possible to have aerial sprayed that without all kinds of herbicide getting right down to the fish ladder into the riparian zone. And I want you to look at that with your own ideas and see if you agree. Then I want for uh, you guys to expect that Dave will look into the matter, that he'll pull a file somewhere, and that we'll look and see whether or not there were any notes as a part of that file uh, by the agency reps that were on the scene at the time, describing what they did to mitigate the herbicide from getting into the fish ladder in the riparian zone. So that's what we're going to be asking you to do today as far as concrete actions. And with no further ado, our keynote speaker today is simply going to introduce his background to you now. When we get back from the ground tour, uh, he is going to have a more lengthy presentation in which and this is the shocker for you, is that I know from having conversations with some of you uh, that you actually legitimately doubt that herbicide drifts as far as we locals believe it does. Our stories about when the helicopters are spraying a quarter mile away from our home getting sick and vomiting, uh, coming here to the uh, medical clinic that's located on this campus, and you know, going through the whole doctor's routine with me, um, my life signs were off the chart. I was vomiting on the doctor's property after it happened. My wife was vomiting. All of our stories get dismissed as anecdotal because, and this is where part comes in, when we were pesticided in that way, when we contacted Park, we begged them to come out and test our land. Just test, test our clothes. After several weeks of pestering them, which included immediately after it happened, we were told by the pesticide investigator, Mike Odenthal, that his boss, and I don't know if it was Dale or another person, that his boss uh, said no because, quote, we might have rubbed herbicide on our clothes ourselves. Now, a representative of the DEQ who heard that said that that was ludicrous, that 
the type of testing you guys use can identify the concentration of whether herbicide on clothing were applied or whether the parts per whatever you square inch or whatever you know, measuring device you're using, that that was a ridiculous argument. So my orchard was devastated. It's on the corner of my property that's the closest to the herbicide spray. But so uh, our keynote speaker today is an expert agronomist who says that we're right. He says that the herbicide does drift as far as we say it does. And all I ask you to do today is be open to the possibility that we're not a bunch of crazy lunatics, that this whole thing isn't because I am a member of a bizarre religious philosophy that Terry Witt of Oregonians for Food and Shelter has sent out a mailing to several thousand industry people saying this whole thing is because, and then he shares an article I wrote in 1978 when I was 19 on vegan fruitarianism that he found somewhere on the internet that hasn't even been on my own web page for 25 years. I don't even know where he got that article. And he tries to say that my illnesses related to the herbicide exposure was because I eat a risky diet. Well, I'm hoping that what this man's going to tell you will convince you that people out here really are being harmed by herbicide drift, and here's how it happened. That's the second part of Stu's presentation today. The first part is, who is he? Stu? I think it's helpful to understand when you're talking with people. When I do my presentation, it will be an interactive one where anybody can stop me at any time and ask a question or challenge me on a point politely. Um, but, but understanding where somebody comes from really helps you put whatever information they give you in perspective. And uh, I got into this business sort of quite uh, genetics. Uh, my dad uh, was at the University of British Columbia. And uh, the, the last thing he did before he shipped out uh, to Europe, part of Her Majesty's forces, Canada being a close part of the Dominion in the UK, uh, was he calibrated the first documented aerial application of 240 in North America in May of 1943. I have a neat uh, article from a newspaper with a photograph of him beside a, a J3 Piper Cup doing that. Uh, when he came back from the war, uh, he went back to UBC, he got an advanced uh, degree there, but found he wasn't really fit for university life and the politics there. And he, he found a calling to come to America, like many immigrants, because America uh, was a giant in terms of agriculture compared to Canada. And uh, so he, he came to, to the U.S. Initially, his first office was in the Smith Tower in Seattle, which at that time was the tallest building west of the city of Rue. That's a remarkable thing if you think of it. And he started a consulting business. And sometime in the, uh, the mid-50s, um, Lloyds of London became the primary, if not exclusive, insurer of aerial applicants. And for a period of about 25 years, uh, my dad's firm, which uh, is a much more um, aggressive person than I in, in, in the business sense, and it, he had offices in the upper Midwest, in Mississippi, he had uh, two offices in California, and two offices in, in Washington State. So they had a national presence, and every single area allocator basically for a period of 25 years, in his insurance contract, uh, if they had a claim, they basically called my dad. And my dad's firm would investigate and determine, uh, is this related to activities that you participated in? And if so, what are the consequences? And, and actually the firm uh, went beyond just the investigative uh, phase and in many cases acted as the adjuster and actually negotiated settlements to pay settlements. And so I grew up sort of following my dad around, uh, kind of doing, uh, that was the bulk of the, of the business for, for many, many years. And um, eventually, uh, I went into the, the pesticide business. My dad knew that I was young and dumb, didn't have the type of worldly experience and, and sort of basic knowledge to, to be able to function in his role. So he kind of threw me out there. And you know, I worked uh, for a grain elevator uh, firm, and, and uh, 
I did uh, seat preparation, seat treatment, uh, ran a receiving elevator one year, uh, did grain fumigation for shipment, just, just sort of gained some basic experience. And then I worked two years interning um, summers when I was going to college for um, division of uh, Union 76. And they were a vertically integrated company. They made uh, a lot of different pesticides, uh, including a lot of class one materials. Uh, 6.3 methyl methyl carathion being one of my favorites. Um, and so I had a chance to work in all phases of the pesticide industry, you know, formulation, packaging, wholesale, retail. And for one year after I graduated, I had a full-time job, I ran a plant tissue for the soil analysis laboratory. So after sort of running through that little uh, gauntlet, I then for a year uh, worked in Idaho and uh, managed a fertilizer chemical um, retail facility. And at that point, my dad decided I had uh, sort of matured up enough, gave enough experience that he agreed to intern me. So I worked uh, directly underneath my dad uh, for eight years in all sections of the country. I worked on citrus, and cotton, and soybeans, and all over the country. Very interesting um, uh, experience. Uh, here in Oregon and to, lesser extent, and also in Washington, we grow primarily mitocrops, crops that don't have, um, are not the primary focus of most chemical companies. And a lot of the new chemistry that's come out, comes out of the big five: so wheat, cotton, corn, soybeans, and the rest. So getting a chance to work on those crops means you get to see the chemistry in other environments for a number of years before it sort of comes here. And uh, you know, in 1991, I bought my end of the business from my dad, and uh, he ended up retiring in uh, 19. Uh, well, he actually retired three different times, but I uh, retired for good about 1995, and uh, just passed away about uh, two weeks ago. But he left me with a legacy, um, and with a sense of, of uh, balance. I work as a forensic expert. I look at crop loss. I do some personal injury work. I do some property damage work. I do some contract research work, uh, including work for the universities and for EPA. I've also worked as an auditor uh, for EPA on chemical companies. So I have a very balanced view. About 55 to 60 percent of my income comes from industry slash defense type work, and about. 40 to 45 percent of it comes from people who uh, would sort of be classified as plaintiffs or more injured, injured parties. And I've been in this business you know, part time my whole life, but the, the full time since 1983. And I typically get 35 to 40 cases in a year. Uh, a typical case takes two years, sometimes three, to resolve, depending on where it is, sort of in the litigation cycle. Uh, but that's my perspective. That's sort of where I come from. I look at pesticides not as the evil seed of the devil. Uh, I look at them as essential tools to produce food and fiber. Uh, in the same way that, that the fastest and most efficient way to make gravel is to blast with dynamite or nitrate blasting grade, uh, pesticides are powerful tools and have to be used correctly. Uh, and if there's a mistake, whether it's intentional or not, uh, the consequences can be severe. And I'm going to chat a little bit more about that uh, later on. And I interface a little bit with um, all of your agencies at some point in time, depending on sort of uh, where the case takes me, uh, particularly with, with ODA, Pesticide Enforcement Division. as a Dale's office about a month ago on behalf of a chemical dealer on an issue. And I thought I received a very fair and equitable hearing from his staff. They gave me all the time. They asked intelligent questions. Um, they asked me to provide them with a lot of information to follow, which, which we've done. And I'd like to develop um, more of that relationship here because I don't see an easy solution to this problem. This problem has been a long time in coming. It's uh, complex. There's sort of a localized issue here we'll talk in some detail about later, but it's a microsm of 
sort of what's going on sort of all around us. But in, in terms of you know the whole issue of, of is pesticide moving? Is it moving off target? If so, in, in what quantities and what's the mechanism? Um, we have there's some pretty good research that talks about this. I'll go into that in, in some more detail, but it's it's a donut. In, 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 from my perspective, in that most of it's all around the edges, and the real core hasn't been touched. And we'll, we'll kind of come into that later. And I'm, I'm hoping that in a cooperative spirit, we can ultimately find a funding mechanism, hire researchers, and work on a very specific issue. Um, and, and that's part of the presentation that I gave to EPA. EPA, I met um, earlier in the year with them. Uh, we did a similar type tour where we went out, we looked at things. I gave a very different presentation than I'm going to give you uh, because you, you are essentially local folks in, in, in terms of you've been out here before, you've investigated cases here before, you work as a regular part of your business uh, up in, in the woods and in the streams and along the roads here. And so I'm not going to waste time. There's some other presenters that are going to talk about it, and I'm not suggesting that's a waste of time. But I'm, in my limited time that I have, I want to get really focused on what I think is happening what I think the evidence shows and kind of where I'd like to go in terms of a long-term resolution to it. And I think the long-term resolution is, it's, it's, it's got to be science-based. It's got to be, we have to be guided by the truth here. We have to be searching for the truth. We have to be aware of the political and the huge economic ramifications, the interests who are possibly going to get a little bit royal in this process. And we've got to accommodate all that, because that's the reality. That's the world that we live in. But if we have as our guiding staff, if we have the truth that science can provide us with carefully constructed research, I think we'll find the right answers. We'll find the truth. And at that point, it becomes a political solution. And that's sort of beyond me. That's kind of beyond what I do. I'm on you know, the science and the investigative side. But um, when I get in my presentation, I do want each of you to stop at any point if you have a question, comment, anything. Or if after the presentation you have, uh, you say, geez, you talked about some research, I'd really like to study that research. I'd like to see that. You know, and, and Dale's got my contact information, and I'm going to ask everybody just, you know, get it from Dale or get it from me before you leave. And send me an email, call me, and I'll provide you with anything that I can. Uh, you know, reasonably provide that will assist you. Because I'm just assuming everybody comes here in good faith. Everybody has an open mind. We all have biases. I have my own biases. And uh, it comes from the life that I've lived and the work that I've done. And because my my work has been on both sides of the fence almost equitably, um, I think I have a pretty balanced view that helps me go down the center of the roadway and it keeps me from sort of drifting off the center line. So I think it's time We'll uh, hop in the vehicles. Actually, uh, about what okay. we're going to go see. Good. And, and uh, Stu, when you begin uh, your second shift later today, right. if you could give us a couple of minutes about your um, past experience managing okay. actual fleets of helicopters, applying herbicides in timber industry situations. He has vast experience in that specific field actually managing fleets of helicopters doing what happens out here in the hills. So he knows all about it. And he knows exactly how it drifts. And he believes it drifts as far and even farther than I ever believed it drifts. Aaron, you're on. All right. I'm going to continue. Okay. Okay. Pictures 
a real salmon in this creek we're talking about. Right? Fish Creek Road today. They haven't been coming down the road for a while. Mom says they divert the sedimentation onto the forest floor. This is the forest floor, straight up and down forest floor. That's supposed to divert the sedimentation and leave it there. What we have to do is make sure that the sediment goes out mm. onto the floor of the forest before it gets into the creek. There's a tree, I see it. Before I came out here, it was probably 9 o'clock, 8.30. It's still June 2nd. I just wanted to show you just how much Fish Creek has taken over Lake Creek with its dirtiness. It is about three hours later. The last time I filmed was around noonish. It's almost three now. It's now just after 8 p.m., still June 2nd. We still have real dirty water. Thirty-nine point five. So anyway, let's pan out and let's look at the water. It's disgusting. Those readings are off the chart. So you can see that in there. And this is section thirty-four in Prazer. I thought I would take video of the different ways that the fog is moving all at one time, just like Stu Turner mentioned. And I believe. Bottom left, clear cut, you right, can see top right, the clouds is what they're going to spray, but I can't be sure. Do you see that fog, how it's moving? Almost three different ways. supposed to be doing. That, that clip with the helicopter, it, I don't know if you can back it up and just re-show that little helicopter clip, is it? Right there. Perfect. Okay. 
I've got a gentleman here who probably just want to talk, but he's, he's here for you to speak to. His name is Kevin Coleman, um, who uh, is a wine grape grower with a, a really nice block at the bottom of a cut that's a little bit steeper than this and shaped a little bit more like a roll. Um, but he got a drift of uh, sort of the full dose, everything you can think of. Um, the Velpar, Owls, Garlon, G4D, um, and it's a significant quantity. When I say he got a drift, it's not just my opinion. The, the local extension agent came out, took a sample uh, of tissue uh, from the damaged grapes. It was run in an ODA uh, recommended pesticide certified lab, came back positive um, for two of the products used, including Alice, which is uh, so flying is very difficult to find. And we ultimately did a helicopter test. That's why I wanted to stop right at this. But we spent a lot of money, and we had to search the earth to find an aerial applicator that would basically uh, the equivalent of testify against his brother. We had him fly his 206, which is a very, very similar helicopter to the one you see here, up to the cut. And we had a diagram that the pilot who did the job provided, as well as his testimony and deposition, and we tried to replicate what he did. And what happens on these cuts, and, and one Kevin's house is a measured average 65 degree slope, is they were flying, as you see here, at an angle up the slope. When we actually measured that, we found it took 2.8 seconds from the beginning of the run at the bottom until we transitioned from forward flight to what's called hover climb. All of the data that you see about drift relates to forward flight, where the disturbance of the rotor um, is behind and the heavy drop falls before the disturbance of the rotor can get there. If you get into hover flight, it's like the equivalent of, uh, you know, if you see a helicopter landing in smoke or fog, um, it blows that stuff every direction you can think that wind speed's approaching 100 miles an hour plus. And that's a significant issue here is the actual topography that they're trying to make these applications to. And just to give you an example of, of, of slope, if we had a, a 16 degree slope, which is very, very modest for this area, the, if the inboard boom was say 10 feet above the ground, the outboard boom on a typical applicator would be three times farther away. So in, in terms of the drift potential, it's, it makes a huge difference. Go ahead and roll it. I just wanted to interrupt you just for that point. Thanks, Dylan. But if you look, you can actually see he goes into hover climb, and you can see that it's blowing the material down right there. You can see the hover climb. Look at him spray. I got my truck, and he's 20 feet away. 20 feet. But what I'm telling you is we're doing. doing exactly up there what we're supposed to be doing.
learn about two weeks ago. All right, I'd like to end this by saying that um, if the board has determined based on evidence presented to it that forest practices in a watershed are measurably limiting to water quality achievement or species maintenance, the board shall direct the task force to analyze conditions within the watershed and recommend watershed specific practices to ensure water quality achievement or species maintenance. And this is how the forest practices act. So we need to end, and uh, you know that last note. First of all, let's hear it for Aaron for going out and doing what she has done. Because for years we've all been seeing this happen all around us, but Aaron's the first person that thought about you know getting her video camera out, and, and this just happens to be what happened behind her house. It happens all through these hills. Uh, because of our time frame, we are going to need to go immediately to a car, cars. But I do want you to well on for a moment the fact that um, the warehouser uh, contractor uh, was actually threatening to go get a sniper gun and get rid of this problem, uh, referring to Erin and her video camera. And so, you know, when you listen to both sides and you hear who the crazy lunatics are, <laughs> you know, just keep, the, who, keep it in mind who's threatening to get a gun and kill who. Okay, so to our cars, and I'll be the front car, and uh, and we're going to hit a couple of significant spots. Dave? Uh, several people have been uh, on the road for a couple hours today. There's a bathroom here at the meet There's bathrooms at the next two stops at the meet as well. So I just leave it at that. Coffee, now. tea. Yeah. By the way, this doctor does not meet the new National Marine Fishing Standards. Really? <laughs> Go figure. Yeah, we're, we're working on that issue of my old dumb stuff. We like permeable so that the predators can't hide in the shadow of the dock and, and get all the spolts swimming by. Oh my goodness. So they now have to make, make everything out of PSB so that light penetrates. So folks, we want to make this a, a real quick, we want to make this a real quick stop. We happen to be here at a time in the morning when you can't really see what we want to really show you. At other times of the day, when you stand here and look at that mountain, you'll see a series of about seven different clear cuts. Look there at the beginning of that ridge and you can kind of see that there's a clear cut right there uh, on the left. As you work your way over, well that whole mountain is in clear cut rotation. And there are several, you know, obviously fresh clear cuts. Right up above the dwelling structure that you see, you see those trees that are behind it. Well, immediately above that, going all the way to the top of that obviously clear cut ridge, and then you see a few trees to the left on that ridge, and then it, those are two big giant clear cuts that at other parts of the day you can see. They're at really extreme levels of slant and homes like the one you see at the bottom you see when the helicopters fly back and forth doing aerial sprays one of the ways that we get hit by it is that you have to understand that the sprays are done at a higher elevation than where our homes are and so it's just natural that the stuff drifts because it has to come down this lake is the beginnings of what's called Lake Creek. From this lake's end here, all the way down until you get to Mapleton, that salmon-bearing Lake Creek that you were watching in the video, this is its very beginnings of its headwaters. The fish uh, ladder that we're gonna look at next is just a little ways after Lake Creek has begun, and there's salmon there, so be aware that all of these clear cuts on this mountain, that when they are herbicided, we contend that you're already beginning to pollute this lake with herbicides that after your first rains, after they're sprayed, we contend that herbicide is washing right off of that hillside, right into this lake, which is the beginnings of the headwaters of the Salmon Bearing Creek we're going to look at.
Well, they're all getting it from either wells or, and then one of the dirty little secrets out here is that many of us are on spring water. Many of us, including I have moved the water right to spring water, are drinking the water that comes right out of the clear-cut hills that are herbicided. Uh, the government doesn't necessarily like that, but the reality is if you were to survey the people that live along Highway 36, and off of Highway 36, probably something like half of us are drinking the waters that are coming out of the hills. We have legal water rights that we've had since the 40s and 50s, and that's where we get our drinking water. Anyways, we have to actually move quickly so we can get to most of this time to end. of the dirty water flowing into the clean water. Well, this is the clean water. This is Lake Creek. It begins there at the lake where our first stop was. And down here to our right, there is a fish ladder. And the protected coho uh, salmon shoot through here. What I want to call your attention to, and this is about the best news of the yeah, it's better down ahead. Okay, if you stand exactly right so that the sun gets blocked by the trees, and each person takes a turn standing where I am now, you can see that that's a clear cut. It was done about three years ago. So look at the top where those palm trees are, and looking straight down, that entire side of that mountain was clear cut. Now, briefly, because it has to be a short stop, two in official numbers. What would you estimate that slope to be? Close to 70 degrees. If you're looking at about a 70 degree slope that was clear cut, basically directly below that is the riparian zone, the fish ladder, the protected coho salmon shooting through there. And so my question to you is, if that was aerial spray, and today, not even expecting it, someone handed me the paperwork while we were in there together, where they've gone into the ODF office and did the research. It turns out it was aerial spray. So we now know that. That was one of the questions I was asking to find out for us. We now know. That slope, directly above a riparian coho salmon protected fish ladder, was aerial spray. Now, I ask you, exercise common sense here like a lay person. Do you think you can fly a helicopter back and forth there and prevent the herbicide from drifting essentially straight down into the fish ladder in the riparian zone? So what we're going to ask is that you will pull out your notes in the ODF file on this specific spray and show us what notes were taken by the specific ODF forester in charge of this spray was there any Department of Agriculture person involved with okaying this spray? We want follow-up. We want to know the answers. You know, and if you're into searching for truth, understand this. This is a quick stop we can make right on Highway 36. We're only being able to show you several stops out of dozens that the people involved with have wanted shown today. This is the tip of the iceberg. Stuff like that shouldn't be happening. Let's go to uh, the next stop. We said. The label would have very restrictive language in regards to the application. The label may not apply to uh, uh, restrictions in regards to the slope. But the, the law, pesticide law, does require that application activity to confine it to the application site. So we, in that particular yeah. situation, if there was an aerial application, the applicator would have been responsible for any and all the options to prevent the opportunity of off-cutting. Now, not
not knowing the specifics of when and how and yeah. what was applied to that site. And we're fire-minded folks, so you see what we're simply asking you to do is look into that, look for the paperwork, look for the notes that were taken, and let's do some follow-up and find out about this spot. Now we really have to okay. move on. Yes. Very quickly, since we have Department of Forestry people here, we have a great time for opinion. There's a slope, here's conditions, you're here. Right now would be a good time to spray that clear cut work site. I would not offer an opinion. I would say that what we would focus on is uh, that you're the, the one that enforces the, the Oregon Forest yeah, Practices and that's Act. And that's what I'm trying to say. The regulations that we would enforce would be, uh, or administer, would be no direct application within 60 feet of a type B stream, which this, or type F, so stream yeah, the, the inside and, of the boom could, could be legal, but the outside of the boom could be illegal. Uh, how, how the operator does that is up to the operator. As Dale, it's very much outcome based, is what Dale said. Sure. So, so you know what we might identify with? because we're not into like slapping someone's I, hand I, and getting someone in, in trouble. I'm no, I'm not saying you are, but I am going to have everyone respect my time limits starting this moment. Okay. Okay. And what I am going to simply say is all we want is some honest working relationship where when we show things like this, you guys will do some follow through and be in dialogue with Let's us. Look at the about application this. record. Let's see what the pilot says. Mm -hmm. Let's see how he flew it. Absolutely. Let's see what the conditions are. By Aaron's vehicle, she's going to take you up Fish Creek to where the dirty water met the clean water, and I am going to run another errand. And so, Aaron, I'll meet you at the bottom of Fish Creek. I'll be there in about 20 minutes, and I know you won't be there for at least 30 minutes. So, uh, Aaron, it's got to be a straight up there, point straight back, and if anyone starts asking you even brilliant questions, you have to cut them off and get them back in the van. Here, just real quick, everyone, just real quick. We have a number of guesses of what my thoughts are. You're an expert with that herbicide? Looks like the geology. Looks like the geology. Like like do you want to take it I, back and test it at the laboratory? <laughs> no. Let's be definitive here. It's now yours. I've seen thousands of different plant species. That okay, because of time, because of time. Load them up. Let's the slope you've got these center cuts where you're going to be um, you know in most labels uh, in, in, in you know the label is sort of the guiding document most labels are intentionally vague because the manufacturers don't want to impede sales so they'll recommend a, a release height of 15 to, to 20 feet 
but there's no maximum. Most of the labels for these products do not have a maximum on them. And that's one of the things that we think needs to change. I don't think that we've known for a million years that the height of release is directly correlated to whether or not it's going to land in or near the target zone. That's physics. So, you know, one of the minimum changes that we'd like to see occur is, you know, we're going to basically force these people to figure out how to do more of this stuff differently. Because you cannot fly a loaded helicopter on these slopes and maintain 15 to 20 feet. You just can't physically do it. Now, there aren't a lot of trees sticking up here, but on an awful lot of clear cuts, they leave the central trees, woodpeckers, raptor perches, uh, all these other things. It's an encouraged sort of practice that creates a, a further obstacle. I mean, we took the deposition of a pilot, and his testimony initially was, well, at all times, I was you know, five to seven feet from, from the ground. <laughs> and then we took and drew a 45 degree slope on the paper and drew the helicopter you know, flying straight and level and said, now, how far is it from the out, outer part of your boom to the ground? Well, he never took geometry. He couldn't answer that. But we know what that distance is, and that increases the, the risk factor. That's even assuming that the inboard portion of it. When Mr. Coleman's case went to trial, they introduced evidence. The defendants introduced evidence in that case. A number of the defense exhibits showed these helicopters spraying these clear cuts between 75 and 150 feet above the ground surface releasing herbicides. Now, I'm, Dale, I'm all ears. If you can tell me that that's acceptable, um, you know, from a regulatory viewpoint, then we need to go change the regs. Certainly, from a regulatory standpoint, if the material was being applied and it was, it was being maintained on the target area, then currently, as the laws exist, that application would have been lawful. That's why we're moving in the direction we're moving to make a change to put label language that says maximum relief height is X. The second part of that, the part of that that makes that work, is we need to have actual enforcement. And when I say enforcement, I don't mean running around writing tickets every place. What I mean is we need to have unannounced spot checks with digital video that we can later scale the aircraft and we can, we can go back and we can determine. And we need to do it unannounced. Because what's happening now is they're letting them know, by the way, we're going to come watch you spray. Yeah. Oh, and, okay. And That's I've good. learned as an auditor that there's a really big difference between an announced audit and an unannounced audit. And I think we get the best data if we just sort of go into the paperwork and we've got Department of Forestry. It's, it's, you know, they've got these notice of intents filed. We need to have a little communication to where they give us, you know, 24, 48 hour notice as they move block to block. And we need to be prepared as they're moving to have a team that's going, that's documenting this. And we need to have that label change to set the table. There's, there's nothing that Dale can do from an enforcement viewpoint with the way that the label's currently written unless there's some type of sampling and analytic procedure that documents movement outside the target area. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah, but currently, I mean, what you're what you're identifying is the fact that these labels are U.S. EPA labels. They yes. are federal labels. Correct. Nationwide. So EPA is already in the process of reviewing the drift mitigation measures. Right. Uh, on a national basis, so that is already in the it, mill. It is in the mill. We're, we're working on that. The other side of that same coin is, you know, the 100,000 acres of land that I have to manage that we do grow crops on that's non-forestry. We use some of the same chemistry. Dioron is an example. Atrazine is an example. Uh, Metribuzin is another example. Um, all of the phenoxies. Uh, I've got areas that are in 7-inch rainfall. It, 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 the lowest rainfall in, in, in basically in the United States, dryland, so we're only cropping them every other year. There isn't open water any day of the year within 5 to 30 miles. It's flat terrain, and I have 300-foot buffers. And then I come out here, and I see the water, and I see the clear cut. And, yeah, there there is a buffer, but the physics of what goes on here is a whole lot different. Also, the use rate is much different. 
sister compounds there so uh, there doesn't seem to be the right balance I guess is, is sort of my point the risk factors here the physics of the challenge of the application that is here the climate that is here the habitat and the fish that are here none of that exists over there where I'm dealing with a 300 foot buffer although it's only 100 feet if I use a ground rig okay but I've got circles that you know come up to what are on a BLM map, it's also a county map, they're called a type 5 or an ephemeral stream, which means by every fourth or fifth year we'll get a heavy snowfall and then a Chinook, and for about 20 or 30 minutes there'll be about this much water runs down there, and somebody put that on a map, and that's now actionable as a type 5 ephemeral stream in terms of what I have to do as an operator in terms of complying with these label requirements, these buffer zones, um, and I, there is a place for buffer zones. I think this is the place for, for buffer zones. And I, I, when I compare what goes on in Oregon with what goes on to the north, and we have similar conditions, it's not exactly the same, but I can tell you that the average acre in this area, and I'd say this area, like let's just take a 40-mile swath here, uh, just, just circumference right here. If I compare this area to many areas in Washington, they're using on average about four times the amount of chemistry that we're using. We simply do not use as aggressive as a herbicide program as they use here. And I don't mind if they use it here if they can sort of show me that they can put it all on the target area and none of it is, is leaving during the application or after the application. And you know, I, I mentioned volatility. There's some really good studies and certainly anybody who wants some can, can contact me where they've done tests and they know the percent uh, of volatility of these compounds. And sometimes it's as high as 40% of what's applied that did land in the target zone leaves in a vapor form in the 72 to 84 hours following the application. Depending on temperatures, it's very, and of course we typically have cooler temperatures when they apply here, but there are some exceptions. They'll start in September, and there are some warm afternoons in, in September with some of the spray programs. And what, you, what you'll see happen here is They'll come in, they sometimes do, the first application is what's called site prep. If they get a lot of regrowth after they log, but before they plant, they'll do a site prep job. If they come in, sometimes they'll just do a direct uh, application. And, you know, when I look here, it, I, I see signs like somebody has been doing something here. It just looked like this might have been sprayed. Yeah, I think it may have been sprayed, but of course, Willie Bronson won't let me know. Yeah, anymore. it just sort of looks... I, mean, I, I can't be positive, but if you, if you kind of take a look at the broadleaf species here, it looks like somebody's been doing a little something. Yeah. So then they'll plant, and then they'll come right, and they'll do what's called conifer release, where um, if you look over on this hillside over here, it's an older cut, and you, it looks like this face here got a relatively good shot of herbicide, but it looks like they missed on that ridge line going down. And you can see the difference. You can see the pressure. You know, from the, the big leaf maple, the ceanothus, and, and, and some of the other fairly aggressive growers, I understand why they do it. But um, we have the same pressure in Washington, but on average, we're using a, between a third and a quarter on a per acre basis of the, of the total load of, of, of herbicide chemistry that's going on here. So it's, it's kind of become a local habit. It's a local practice. And, they're, they are effective tools. They do a good job. I mean, and they do. I've looked at all kinds of forest articles. You can see the conifer releases. The growth is directly responsive. There's very little mortality to the conifer I don't know why they're doing That's just, you know, my issue is my right to swing my fist ends where your nose begins. Just through Oliver Wendell Holmes, our greatest Supreme Court justice. That was his description of. That's where we're stepping in, right where your nose starts. Wait, okay. Wait, we don't want to stay for too long, or Daniel okay. get mad at us. Oh, he will. We're going to roll. The last thing I want to say is that um, 
When I reported the dirty water, ODF came out and they said they couldn't find the specific breach of where it's emptying into our water. But my theory is clear cut, clear cut, clear cut, dirt, disturbance, erosion, the entirety is what made my water okay. dirty. I don't need one little breach of mud falling in. Yeah, it's point Look, versus entire. non point. This is an area non point source rather than it's a specific culvert point source. So maybe we need to make a regulatory change that addresses that point Which because point? it is a cumulative. It's just sort of like setting TMDLs and, and, and looking at them. You have to manage it on a sub watershed by sub watershed basis, and it is directly related to obviously the land management. Hey, Steve, present conditions right now. Uh, you know, I don't have my sort of instrumentation, but I, I am feeling sort of a breeze. It's Thank a downslope you. breeze. Most of us have, have kind of felt it. Yeah. Uh, I'd be concerned. The, by the way, the, the, the easiest, fastest, best way to, to tell if you have conditions that are right is usually at the top, in the center, and towards the bottom of the cut, I take a little plastic bag of green grass clippings and a highway road flare. I light the road flare. I stick it in the bag. And I go on to the next one, I go on to the next one. I get all three lit, I get on the opposite ridge, and I'll, I'll film it. And you'll see exactly where the air goes. It's a very dense, very white smoke that gets generated. And I don't think there's a substitute for actually direct observation on site. Uh, I also like weather instrumentation, but to be honest with you, what goes on here is not the same as just 500 feet above us. And if you look at the size of these slopes, they tend to treat these units in whole. In other words, in one day, they'll come in, they'll spray all of this mm -hmm. sure in is. one day. Mm -hmm. And the conditions change significantly throughout the day. Yeah. And yet, if you look at, uh, and I'm going to pick on, on ODA a little bit here, if you look at ODA's forms that they're required to fill out, the pilot's got to make an observation as what he believes the weather is, and he's got to write that down. Okay? And that's his best guess. But remember, he's in, the, he's in a three-dimensional environment in the helicopter, He's looking out. He's, this, this is a high-risk business. There's snags and wires and equipment and people, and you're just everywhere you go, you're looking for stuff. And he's moving in three dimensions, mostly at a forward airspeed if he's doing what he should be doing at 55 to 60 miles an hour. And he's making a judgment at whatever time he starts a particular block, that's what it is. And he writes it on his pad. 15 minutes later, it could change. 15 minutes later, it could change. There's no provision for any change in the form. There's no provision, there's no obligation for him to report anything different. And quite frankly, uh, what usually happens is the timber company guy is sitting on the top of the ridge in his pickup, and he does have a wind anometer. And usually he's got relative humidity and a few other things, but that's relevant only to what's happening at the top of the ridge. You come off the ridge 1,500 feet and go into the bottom, that, that data's just not relevant. It's simply not scientifically relevant. But we know that because we've studied sort of these issues. So that's a that's a deficiency that we need to address. It's a forestry specific deal. So, so do you currently have data that kind of identifies the? Well, the, actually, we, the, we do, and I'll be. At, at I, I've got about elevations. fifteen. I've got fifteen uh, data loggers out, and I'll be pulling the data in November from those, and it's related to another issue. But uh, it's just, it's an eleven hundred foot, uh, you know, elevation change. Is that here in Lane County? It is not. Okay. No. It's in Washington does? State. Oh, it's, it's in Washington. It is State. in Washington okay. State. I would like. That's part of what I. You're, you're beating me to my punch. That's part of what I'm going to talk to you about later, in terms of what I think we need to do, is we need that information for Lane County and this environment, because I think it's different here. But I think all slopes have some general uh, similarities in that what happens on the top has nothing to do in many cases with what's going on in the middle or in the bottom, all at the same time. And we need to figure out a better way to do it. And we now have all these neat electronics. And I can tell you that the, the helicopters have the ability to use a GPS system that maps them. I don't know if you've seen them. Yes. But uh, I love that because it shows every single time when the, the nozzle was turned on, when it was turned off. And some of them even give you the GPS ground speed. And so a lot of these arguments about flying up slope and, and, and all the, you know, rotor wash, all that stuff, we could eliminate a lot of this if during the audit process we could go pull that data card, dump that data into our PC, give them back their data card, and compare that with some of the on-site measurements 
Then we know. We not only know what happens, we'll know how it happens, when it happens, and then we can begin to address how to stop it from happening. All right. Okay. Well, I've reported two sprays where it's not raining at the beginning but by the end it's rained and I have documented that two different instances so weather does change agenda Stu is beginning his presentation back at the Grange in four minutes so we're gonna knock off the stop that would have been after this one which is my place I put it last in case someone had to be sacrificed, it would be me. A lot of other folks had wanted a lot of other places seen, and we probably hurt some feelings uh, today not being able to show them all. But this spot right here is significant in that uh, in the uh, beginnings of the Pitchfork Rebellion, one of the things that we did and why we organized was because this particular property, uh, some years back, when there had been a combination at the same time of aerial spray happening at the same time that a ground uh, roadside spraying was done um, I'm gonna can we gather here for a second so I can speak softly there's a uh, young man that lives here uh, probably in his late teens or, or so right now and after one bout of a combination of aerial spray happening at the same time as a roadside spray within the roadside spray within was in 20 feet of his bedroom window. It was at a time when the roadside spraying was being done at nighttime, and the folks didn't know it was being done at nighttime. His bedroom window, he slept with it open, and ever since that bout of spraying, uh, he's never been able to return to public school. Uh, at the time, he was about 13 or so, uh, had a nervous disorder that prevented him from returning to public school. I don't want him to hear us talking about uh, him, because uh, obviously this is a traumatic experience in his life. So that had already happened before there ever was a pitchfork rebellion. So then, some years had gone by, five years or something like that, and a clear cut came. This brush you see right here, only about 20 feet thick. Yeah, and the clear cut is right behind this brush. Came right up to there, which is the middle of this garden. So in this stop, what I hope to bring to your attention is what happens a lot out here is the property line of the timber company, their private property, is very intimate to a home. The middle of this garden. Now, since then, because the Pitchfork Rebellion found out uh, from the folks here that this a new aerial spray was going to happen, the clear cut actually, at that point, uh, came to the middle of this garden. And then subsequently, the family, with the help of us, was able to negotiate with Roseburg a lease of 60 feet. So that the property line, even though it would be the middle of this garden, now comes 60 feet further, probably to about where this is cut or a, a little bit beyond. But the original clear cut had come all the way to the middle of that garden. Now, there was scheduled to be aerial spraying. You remember, this is several years after the boy was not able to return to school, ever. So the mother uh, turned to us, having heard about our uh, you know, rallies and things like that that we were doing, and asked for help. We were able to, uh, and it wasn't easy, but we were able to get Roseburg to agree to ground spray that time. Afterwards, uh, Dave Ramsey told me, the Roseburg guy told me that, well, yeah, we, we ground sprayed instead uh, but that meant that we decided to use something far nastier than we would have if we would have aerial sprayed. So imagine when the Pitchfork Rebellion doesn't get in the middle of something like that. This was going to be aerial sprayed right up to here. Legally, that can happen. 
So, you know, look at the house. And imagine what it's like to live in a situation where a helicopter would be swooping, making passes this close to your house. And the last time that happened in combination with ground spray, your 13-year-old uh, never returned to school afterwards. So, you know, understand that what I'm showing you all through these hills, there are homes with border lines that intimate to the timber industry. So I ask you, as we have to turn around and get back for uh, Stu's presentation, even then we're going to be 10, 15 minutes late into his presentation time. I ask you to consider if we really are so crazy. I mean, you know what? Even if you are a timber guy, you got your own kids and stuff like that, it's okay to be a timber guy and it's okay to earn money that way and it's okay to be an agency person. But all we are asking, and it's not give peace a chance, all we are asking <laughs> is for an aerial spray buffer zone around homes and schools. That's all the notorious pitchfork rebellion, the lunatics led by the crazed men <laughs> Terry Wake calls me a megalomaniac cult leader in the <laughs> mailing he sent out to several thousand industry representatives with talking points on how they can attack me and he's in pri hired a private investigator to find out everything about me they're looking to see if they can get me on taxes and things like that that's what industry is doing to me simply because when people like this called me and said god our, our kids never gone back to school say. after the spray they're going to aerial spray again it comes right into our garden can you help us so anyways, with this in mind, let's return back to the Grange Hall. But directly behind uh, my house where Warehouser is going to do a clear cut, big steep hill, they're going to do a, a clear cut uh, in a few years, it'll be scheduled. What I'm going to show you is that coming down that mountainside next to my home, every, you know, 100 yards or so is a small little rivulet of water um, including the one that we have drinking water rights to. This entire mountain range that you're seeing, every hundred yards or so, there's a rivulet of water coming down. It all empties in to Coho Salmon Barren Lake Creek. So the point is, if we're going to get into real science and not pseudoscience, which is all we really call for, we're going to get into real science and throw politics out of the scenario. Then, what you guys in the forestry department, in the Board of Forestry, and, and good-minded ethical foresters and timber industry guys need to do with your Forest Practices Act is you need to better account for those, and then you know how you give the names to the Class A's, Class B's, whatever your names are for the different types of waters coming down the mountain. Right now what's happening is you're clear cutting, you're spraying, the spray's getting into all these little rivulets of water that did every one of them off this mountain is emptying into salmon bearing Lake Creek. The cumulative effect is tremendous. And with that, Stu Turner. Thank you. A few of my comments I shared if you were in the bus with me. Um, and, and they wanted me to mention again, sort of a little more of my background. I, um, was chairman for 13 years of the Helicopter Association International's Aerial Applications Committee. And for the 13 years preceding that, my dad was the chairman of that committee, and I attended a number of those meetings. Um, and as chairman, I worked on a number of different issues, two really critical issues. One of them was um, the FAA standards, the engineering standards for the actual application equipment that's affixed to the helicopter. Uh, they have proposed some new standards that we objected to. We worked closely with a couple of uh, uh, FAA inspector engineers and reached sort of a, an understanding and, and, and changed that. The other, the other thing we did is we worked on what's called rapid refueling. Um, if you're in these spray blocks, uh, most of the wear and tear on a turbine is in the shutdown and the startup. If they run continuously, they run better and they run cheaper. Um, and so we were able to work with the NFPA and get a specific exemption in for air ambulance and for aerial application. Um, one of the central questions here is, where does the material go? Where, where, what is the potential for drift? And again, I, I, I said earlier, I like to be interactive, so I'm gonna like call on people. I'm gonna call on JLDL. 
what do your knowledge, based on your years in the, in the industry, is sort of the threat zone? How far do you think an area allocation herbicide has the potential, under a worst case scenario, to go? I really can't answer. I mean, really, on each application. Well, just just, just so as a general rule, variables. I, I don't. But when you look at lots of reports from investigators, correct. what has what is the farthest distance that your department that you can recall has documented movement of a pesticide? That's my recollection. Probably less than a quarter mile. Most of our investigations are are uh, addressing impacts in a very close proximity. Right. Yeah. And, and, and I'll have to say that's very very typical. Um, a lot of the state regulators I work with, they give actually good, very similar answers. Some of them will go out to half a mile, but most of them say it's proximate property, it's either joining or it's one field over or two fields over. Um, in my neck of the woods, we're notorious for lots of things. One of them is that we grow some high quality grapes and we make some very high quality wine, much better than that junk in California. Um, and a vineyard is worth a lot of money. Um, some vineyards in certain APAs are probably worth on the order of $60,000 an acre. So if you get a serious hit, it's like a big issue. Um, in, in 1989, 1990, we had a series of drift incidents that happened. Essentially, in my backyard, I could actually see the field that was sprayed on one of these. It's actually the inside of my house. I can set my deck with my binoculars. I can look at it. And it was uh, an 840-acre Kemp Fowl job that was done uh, with a fixed-wing aircraft. Um, and fortunately, one of the ingredients in the tank mix was Paraquat. And Paraquat is an interesting compound. It's a, uh, one that it produces a very specific symptom. There's only two or three chemicals that cause a similar symptom. They were able to do a records call in and, and confirm that only this application uh, had taken place and none of the other similar chemistries had been used within a, a, a wide area. And there was a very specific pattern that, that sort of was elliptical shaped, uh, which is sort of typical. Most spray grip patterns will either be in a V with the point kind of coming towards the source, and then as you move farther from the source, the symptoms become less and less and less in the uh, This particular case, it was notorious because the drift occurred over 100,000 people in the Tri-Cities. The application took place about five or six miles south of town, and it went all the way across uh, most of Kennewick, parts of Richland, most of Pasco, and kept going. Uh, the State Department of Ag uh, had an innovative investigator who figured out uh, what he needed to do, and he sort of developed something on the fly. And because this produces, this chemical produces a little necrotic spot, um, they could see whether they were sort of inside or outside of the spray zone by just looking at the lush growing irrigated plants, a lot of which were broadly very sensitive. And what he figured out is, after they did the first few tests, if we take 10 of these leaves that have 10 spots each, uh, we still can't find this material. But if I take a little puncher, like a little, we're making a punch for a notebook, and I just punch those necrotic spots out, and I volumetrically concentrate by just testing the areas that are affected, or we can adequately find it. Well, in fact, they did that, and according to the official state report, a copy of which is available, um, they defined the spray from this one spray block, the 840 acres. The spray drift pattern was eight miles wide and 16 miles long. Uh, exception, and, and clearly not ordinary, not, not, not something that, that occurs every day. Um, maybe not even once in a blue moon. The Department of Ag started sort of some special funding um, on research associated with it, and other monies were appropriated federally and went to PNNL. And PNNL is Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, and I live sort of on the outer fringes of town, but if you look at statistics across the United States, the, 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 the city of Richland. Um, has more PhDs per capita than any place in the United States. Uh, because we have Hanford, we have the cleanup project, we have the nuclear power, the bomb makers, and we have uh, 
the, the environmental cleanup experts, and we have PNNL, we have a lot of really smart people. And they got a, a, a grant, and the reason they got a grant is that they have been doing a lot of studies about where things go in the air. Because there were a number of releases, test releases of radioactivity from Hanford over the years. And they got very sophisticated in their modeling with uh, advanced meteorological, uh, a lot of data, and with the advent of computers and, and computer modeling, they got very sophisticated at figuring out if we have a release of anything into the air at this point, under these conditions on this day, where does that go? And one of the first things they figured out is that there was a huge, huge effect that was not anticipated from topography. Repeatedly today, as we've been out in the country, we've been talking about slope, we've been talking about drainage, and topography is the 800-pound gorilla. It is the trump suit. It is the controller of what goes on in terms of local subclimate, local localized meteorological conditions. Well, PNNL did a study of this particular incident, and they had all kinds of equipment that nobody else has because nobody else was in the who could have bomb making business and had access to almost unlimited funds and unlimited time on those crazy supercomputers. And they not only went out and confirmed the state finding, but they said actually that the pattern went 22 miles. And they sort of, uh, this is all in a report, a copy of which would be available if you can contact me. Um, and what they, what they did is they explained how it occurred. Because once they had sort of confirmed that it did occur, the obvious next question pending in front of everybody is, how did this occur? And what they found is, the application took place upslope on a bench. There's a strong canyon called Badger Canyon that is just south of Kennewick that acts sort of as a sink. And that we had the right meteorological conditions to keep that in a relatively compressed area sort of like an expanded um, um, inversion, but not exactly. And it explained through all of this meteorological conditions, some of which they had not told the public they had before, because it was related to the weapons type thing. And uh, so they, they explained it all. And they've gone further since then, and they've developed a, sort of a, a, a 3D model. All of the data that EPA relies on, uh, is in terms of drift, it really derives back to the SDTM, the Spray Drift Task Force. And that's an industry uh, association that was formed in 1990, and they got busy and started doing research. They spent almost $20 million researching aerial spray drift. And that's a lot of money. If I had $20 million, I can't even imagine what I could do with that. Um, and uh, they kept a tight lid on it. It didn't release it to the public for a long period of time. Finally, summaries appeared, and uh, some literature came out in 1996 that, that just, just summarized it. And I was crestfallen, crestfallen to discover that for $20 million, the total amount of time they had a test aircraft in the air was half the amount of time it took to spray that 840 acre block. They made 45 half mile runs in two replicates. They made a total of 90 spray runs. So 100 acres worth, 150 acres worth tops. That's it. That's the total scientific basis upon which EPA relies for this greatest task force test. Here's another little hummer for you. Where do you suppose they did that? Well, they picked a part of Texas that's absolutely as flat as a laser as far as you can see. They then took all of that data and they dumped that into a computer ball called Agrift, which is available to regulators, not to the public. There is a public available model called AgDisc that's derived from that. And if you go to that, one of the things you'll see is that there are limits in the parameters that you can enter. And it's a typical computer program. If you pull up a fill in the blank form and it asks you the temperature and the relative humidity and and the wind speed, the wind direction as it relates to the line of flight, um, the release height of the aircraft, the speed of the aircraft, all these little things go in there. 
but there's absolutely no way to input anything for complex terrain. And if you look at this terrain you see here, and you picture in your mind, Texas, you realize that this data has essentially no bearing at all. And they spent $20 million for it. It's just, I guess it's legalized back then. I mean, it's just like robbery in, in my mind. We didn't get very much for our money. So that's a real disappointment. Can I ask a question sure. here? Since we only have you for a final amount of time. Right. Uh, the Board of Forestry is a uh, policy setting board rather than a regulatory board. Right. So I think we're looking at what we're seeing today in, in the context of as we set policy in the future, or as we look at applications, what is it that we want to do? What is it we see? I'll just, that's, that's a so, great but, question. But, but hang on here a second. So uh, you've asked questions today all about, uh, mm -hmm. uh, about labeling. Uh, is it, and he says that really regulation is based on, is, is outcome based, and I understand that. Right. So I think, you know, the humane interest of all of us sitting here is about how does this affect human health? I mean, we want people to be healthy. We don't want it. So, so it strikes me there should be some great body of knowledge about human health hazards from spraying that should be accessible to us that has an impact on us that gives us some real answers rather than dealing with some of these other indicators along the way. Thank you. Good question. There's not a good answer for it. And, and that's one of the reasons it's a great question. Um, EPA requires a huge amount of talk staff. Um, and obviously, we basically don't use people experimentally. We use animals and plants. Okay. Uh, and, and since most of the, the stuff that's going on here is herbicides, and that's really where my expertise is, is on, on we use plants as what we call sentinel monitors. Okay, sensitive plants tell us where things are going, and to some degree, of what concentration. And we sometimes can line everything up, and it'll tell us what the source is. That's always the question: is where did it come from? What is it? Where to come from? What concentrates it in? And your question is the follow on what does that mean to us? What does that mean to me? There's a disconnect between the testing that EPA requires, which is very extensive. Um, you know, where they put a little dab and there's a rabbit eye test, there's a rabbit skin sensitivity test, uh, there's guinea pig tests, there's air, uh, there's air inhalation, breathing tests, there's dietary exposures. <laughs> Um, so every sort of route of exposure has been studied in animal models, um, and there are there is a body of knowledge that sort of tries to tie that work to you know humans. That's really outside of my expertise, and I, I can't tell you a lot about that, so I can't really answer that. So I come back to the other side, which is our focus should really be on how do we keep the materials in the target zone. Because if we keep the materials in the target zone. Uh, just one semicolon, because then take off from there. I just want to call your attention to uh, Lisa Arkin. Can you raise your hand, Lisa? Uh, she's the director of the Oregon Toxics Alliance, and she brought to this part of Oregon a medical doctor who's an expert in how the pesticides interact with the human beings. And the basic nutshell thing is that for every um, overt exposure where someone like me vomits or you know something can be looked at that would be very small he said he's virtually even never seen that he said that what is known is that it's the long-term cumulative effect and that most of the people who get cancer from herbicide exposure get it 10, 20 years after the fact, never had an acute experience, never vomited, never maybe even knew they inhaled herbicide drift, and he said that's where the cancers come from. But for that conversation, I would put you in touch with Lisa and with that specific doctor, and perhaps that specific doctor can be interfaced with you guys, perhaps in Salem, to make it easier for you. In fact, if you are going to have that conference that we heard you were going to have about herbicide issues with the different government agencies, perhaps he could be included as an expert and perhaps Stu can be included as an expert. And some of us would hope to uh, speak, we'll, we'll totally drop our request to speak if you'll talk to Stu and if you'll talk to that doctor. And with that, Stu, continue. 
So I, I've been adequate to really respond fully to you, and I apologize for that. Um, I want to come back to plants as bioindicators. And uh, it's a tricky, tricky deal because every chemistry has its own site of action in the plant, its own mode of action. And one of the things about uh, herbicides is that you're almost never talking about acute doses in terms of plants. It's almost always subacute. You have symptoms on a plant. And there are, there, there are mimic symptoms. There are certain viruses, certain weather conditions. There are even certain varieties of plant that, will, that just have a growth habit that will mimic certain herbicides. This is not for the, the lay person, okay? But there is some excellent research, and I'll point you to uh, Dr. Tom Flieger. He's an EPA researcher out of Corvallis. And, and his seminal work in, in the late 80s, early 90s um, with uh, Dr. Fletcher on the effects of sulfonylureas is, is, is classic. And it cumulatively led to, in 2001, EPA had a, put together a seminar where they brought experts from around the world. There was a guy there from Switzerland, a guy from South Africa, a guy from Israel. There was a bunch of people from the U.S. There was about 40 scientists that all, and all that gathered and looked at this issue, this low-dose, repetitive sort of effect. And uh, that's published. I have a copy of sort of the proceedings. But the proceedings, like a lot of things don't capture the interchange that went on sort of there. Fortunately, Dr. Carl Arney, who's the EPA Region 10 toxicologist, had invited me, and I was able to be present. I was able to sort of, you know, interact with these people. And I'm just going to tell you about one little piece of research. Um, sweet cherries, major crop in, in, in Oregon, and one of sort of interest here because if you've been to the Hood River or you've been to the Dalles, the topography there is somewhat similar to here. You have these really steep slopes, they're forested, and then uh, in some cases in the Dalles, you run out of trees and it's wheat fields. And below you have trees. Well, any place you have either forest or wheat fields, and you have herbicide applications, and then you're going to have that air drainage issue down below. So we want to know what is the effect of ultra low doses. And again, we just stick with plants here, but it's a good indicator. They took Tyvek, which is that sort of vapor barrier you see on the inside of the house, uh, on the walls when they're building it, and they made sleeves. And at full bloom, they put a sleeve over, this is in the Willamette Valley, just up the road here, uh, over, over a, uh, this is Royal Land cherries, one of the older varieties of, of sweet cherries, which we primarily use as a processor cherry. It's a maraschino cherry, ultimately. Uh, and they closed them up, and then they had a little tiny atomizer, sort of like a micro a perfume type thing where they could just go and just a little bit of this chemistry this, and they used chlorosulfuron uh, which was the first of the, the supply ingredients would go in there and what they did is they took one third of the field use rate one tenth and then, then, then one one hundredth one one thousandth one ten thousandth one one hundred thousandth and the field use rate of chlorosulfuron is classically six four to six tenths of an ounce per acre. So by the time you get done putting the zeros to it, it, it would be the equivalent of um, a teaspoon would be, a, you know, a couple hundred acres, okay? Um, so uh, it, 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 we're, we're trying to see how biologically active these compounds are. And they did it at a particularly sensitive stage, right at full bloom. The most rapidly growing part of the plant is the flower that's going to convert to the fruit. These chemicals go to the growing point. They preferentially accumulate there. That's where their site of action is. And what they found is that anywhere from one ten thousandths of the fraction of an ounce per acre use rate resulted in a 98% reduction in food. In follow-on research, I've got another article that they, they published here. Uh, so here is this. Uh, 1982. They looked at the, the effects of the subacute dose, again, very, very low, one, one thousand, one ten thousand, one one hundred thousand. And what they found is that, that at about one ten thousandths on canola, on soybean, on uh, sunflower, and on smartweed, the four species they studied, that they could again reduce seed production, that part of the crop that we all harvest from 92 to 98% without having a visual 
identifiable symptom of herbicide damage in the plant. So biological activity is not always measured by seeing something burned to the ground. So you think about, you know, how active these compounds are, and what it tells you is it's, it's critically important to keep them in sight. And so thinking about, you know, I'm going to deviate from the line here just a little, thinking about your question because it's, it really breaks us to why you're here. And, you know, maybe what can we do? I, I think that, you know, we have a donut problem here. We have all kinds of good data. I've got some here we could spend hours talking about um, that goes all, that nibbles all around the edge of the problem. But as I was talking with, with the group up on the hill there uh, with the clear cut, we don't have the center. We don't have the center of the data. We need to do, in my opinion, to, to answer the questions that have been raised. And I think it's fair to raise the question in the manner in which these people have, because there is physical evidence, there is documentation of offsite movement. And I think it's fair to raise the question of how much are we losing from these jobs and why? And under what conditions? Because only at that point can we progress forward to say these are the corrective measures that need to be taken. These are the changes that need to occur. And that's what we're looking to, a cooperative thing with ODA, with ODF, where you know we can bring in a researcher who has 16 patents on nozzles He's, he's the guru of ag engineers in this area. He's the guy that will probably do the project. He's relatively close in terms of being on the West Coast. And I think he's available. The second thing we need is we need a meteorologist. We need a guy who's really, really good. And we have this wonderful technology now where we have these little data logs. And we have the ability to take complex data uh, at really frequent intervals um, before, during, and in you know, the two or three days following an application so we can really study what goes on. We can use air pumps and samplers to, to look for entrained um, particles that are in the air, at, and near, and at some distance below. You know, we've got a hypothesis in this case. Our hypothesis is very simple. We have the physical slope, we have the air drainage, which we know and document, we do have research that points to that real well. And we've got to see how much of that is interfacing with the application technology that we're using today. We've only got three or four applicators that are doing almost all of this work. It's a small pool of people that we're working with. I'd like to see um, a research project go forward immediately. I'd also like to see concurrently some label changes about maximum height of release. And I've, I've talked with, with Dale about this and I've talked with EPA. It's really there. It's a federal issue um, unless we want to modify the label for the state, which is not easy to do. And, I don't know if the manufacturer would cooperate with us. They probably would not. But on the federal label, they don't have a, a, a ability to do that. I'd like to interject a thought on your uh, sure. studies. I'm an organic farmer, and my biggest concern is when you wipe out all the vegetation of that earth, they've clear cut all around me, Warehouser has, has annihilated the earth so severely that it's over, over 40 years that, that unit is gray until it becomes. Uh, dug fur again. But isn't that vegetation, in my line of business, that vegetation, those weeds are what add the nutrition back to that soil. And instead of nutrition, you're, you're not at, you're burning up that soil. And then you have to kind of fertilize it. Well, that, that's, I, I understand your point, but that's, studies about that. there, there are, and, but that's sort of offline of what we're, we're on our limited time, I, I, I'll talk to you about that sort of later, but um, there are other unintended consequences of sort of the intensive chemical program that's here. Um, there are answers in terms of, of both the roadside right of way work, um, which I have some real concerns over. And I've been fortunate in that I've, I've been down here, as I mentioned to everybody in the bus, um, for the last 10 years looking specifically at Highway 36. Um, Right after they've, you know, kind of done their 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 applications and evaluated how accurate are they, how compliant are they want. And in my view, they're so wildly in, in compliance, out of compliance with the label. And the reason they're out of compliance is the, the prohibitions on these labels that relate to you know the sensitive areas uh, and the application in some cases directly to waters. And no label allows that except for a couple of aquatic registered products, and even those can't be mixed with the other products that are commonly in the tank. So um, it's a complex 
it's a three dimen four dimensional model because we, all of this goes on and it goes on over time. And it's gone on this way for a considerable period of time. ODA, which has primary authority for pesticide enforcement, has limited resources. Um, I haven't had a chance to really peer into their files to see how much time they're spending down here on a complaint basis. I do know that they can't respond to every complaint they get. Um, and that there's a very really clear record that shows that they don't have the manpower to do that. Um, I don't think you can say everybody who calls in is crying wolf. I think there's a basis for what these people are saying. The reason I say that is I can conceive and I can document. And, you know, and, and the, the great example is Mr. Coleman's case, where that spray site is half a mile from his vineyard. But there's a funnel with a 70 degree flow directly above it, and that air drainage comes right down and dumps onto his vineyard. You get a sample taken by, by uh, an OSU trained scientist running an, an, an ODA recommended pesticide lab. It comes back positive, okay? Independently, we're sitting around the table thinking about this issue three years later. Three years later, we're thinking, oh, oh if we'd have just been here three years ago, We'd have taken more samples and gotten more labs and we'd have done more things, but you can't move the clock back. But somebody had a bright idea. Well, you know, we had a few grapes left after you got smoked, and we made a couple cases of wine. Do you suppose there's a residue in the wine? And you know what? There was. We found the materials in the wine years later. Okay, now with case, would anybody like to drink some? Yeah. It, 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 it actually didn't affect the taste of the wine. It's excellent wine. But here's, here's the problem, and this, this illustrates the difficulty. Even with that evidence present, you know, there's no enforcement by, by ODA. You know, the ODA people primarily come in, and, and Dale can correct me here, they're looking to see if there's a label violation. That's their primary duty. And they will take samples according to an EPA protocol. They'll run them in, in a lab that uses EPA methodology. And most of the time, they don't find anything. And when they don't find anything analytically, they typically don't do anything from a regulatory viewpoint. Okay, correct? Correct. That's just sort of how it works. Mo and I just told you about this research. It shows you, know, you can have a, a, a 92 to 98% reduction in, in yield from a sensitive plant that isn't even showing a symptom. And you can have a highly symptomatic plant that, you know, again, we go to one lab and we get one result. And we, years later, three years later, we go to a different lab. We test the wine and get a result. But there's no outcome for this guy in terms of, of who's, who's paying for my grapes. And, you know, our legal system is, and I speak from experience here, it's, it's, if you compare it to anything around the world, it's, it's heads and shoulders above everything else. But it has a problem. And the problem is, is that the only kind of grease that makes the wheels turn is made of dead presidents. It's very expensive. And when we come out and we're trying to plaintiff a case and recover damages where somebody's had a vineyard wiped out, lost all this, you know, when you lose a vineyard, you lose the four or five years of growth you had into it, then maybe the ground is sterile for three or four years, and then maybe you can plant again after that. And, go through the full expense of reestablishing the crop, and it's a lot of money. But under our legal system, the burden of proof falls completely to the plaintiff, and the plaintiff has to get in, up in court and listen to ODA testify, and ODA gets up and says, well, yeah, we went out, we took samples, but well, we didn't find anything in the lab. And, uh, <laughs> you know, found 240 garland. Well, we found 240 garland, which was, in, in, in Kevin's case, was sort of part of the problem, but the 240 garland, while it was annoying as hell in terms of his symptomology, this is what killed the grapes. The alstus is what killed the grapes because the alstus is 10,000 times more active than 240 garlic, and it's soil persistent for a much longer period of time. So we got a broken system that puts the burden on the damaged party, and I agree that plaintiffs should have the burden of proof. And the, the problem is, is that the average person does not have the resources to pursue it. The average person does not have access to something like me who has the knowledge to come in and take timely samples to go to the right labs and to get results that will stand up in court. So 
you know, and we can't rely on, on ODA, ODA uh, because uh, they, they can't come out all the time. And, and one semicolon, those of us out here know that um, a few years ago when one of the folks did actually go to court and, and sued one of the timber companies because of damages on the property and such, uh, there's a law in place that if you lose, you have to pay the timber company's cost for defending themselves in court. Before it ever got to court, when you meet with the attorneys and the judge and decide what will be admissible and all that different kind of stuff that happens, all the good evidence that they would have liked to have shown was th thrown out in that process so they didn't even get to argue what they hoped to argue when the court case took place. They lost and had to pay over $60,000 um, to the timber company's you know, expenses. And everybody that lives on this highway knew that that happened. And any ideas we ever had of going to court again uh, was gone. But with that and with the time remaining, Stu, could you talk a little bit more about the topographical realities of yeah. this specific area? Well, th that's, that's why I'm driving to the conclusion that until we have the research here, to, to verify, these are very unusual spray conditions. If you take a look at this state of Oregon as a whole, um, the average acre that gets sprayed is mostly low. Okay, this is a small percent of what gets sprayed. We've got we got four or five operators who are basically doing all of this work. That's it. It's a very small pool. It's easy for us to work on that pool. I think it's going to take a combination of. And, 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 you can't defy physics. The topography that exists here is created by God. And it's what we have to work with. And it's a very productive system for the timber companies. They're making money. I'm glad they're making money. I wish they were making more money. I just don't want to make money at somebody's expense. And what we've got now is a situation that's not working. Okay? It's a square pig in a round hole. ODA can't come out and do enforcement if they're spraying 150 feet in the air because the label doesn't say anything about that. ODA can't find them for anything because typically their tests can't find the product. There goes a regulatory response. So it's not working. It's just not working. If we want to identify the factors and the sites that are appropriate and, and are safe to apply, we've got to have on-site research. And, you know, I, I like I say, it, it's a combination of meteorology and, and you know, somebody that's, that's an ag engineer to specialize in aerial dispersal systems, and it's going to take it's going to take that research under Lane County conditions to identify it. Now, what can we do in the meantime? Well, in the meantime, we're going to go work on labeling issues. We know that release height is really correlated with how far things move. Okay, even though almost all that work's done on the, the dead flat, there's a little bit of work that's done. Uh, Dr. Norm Ackerson, who was Dr. Giles' predecessor and who is the most published author. I believe 454 peer-reviewed articles on aerial drift. Uh, he documented a case that was just like Lane County, occurred actually in West Virginia, mountainous terrain, where the material went yeah, 16 miles. And it did exactly as I say has occurred here. It went right down the drainage. They were on the highest part of the highest mountain, and it just went like a snake all the way down. And it's certainly related to weather conditions. Um, we have the added effect here in that compared to West Virginia, seasonally we're getting twice as much rain. So we have a secondary issue that's non-direct application, which is post-application movement by, in terms of, of rainfall. And that's a bigger issue for the roadside right-of-way deal because these roadside ditches are absolutely full of, of water for three or four months of the year, sometimes for five months of the year. And we know, and I have research right here conducted, uh, not in Lane County, but in the county to the north, and uh, good, good research, and the research shows that a substantial amount of this material, on the order of 20 to 25 percent of some of the products, is leaving the target zone. And Stuart, it's leaving it by way of water. Sir, I'm afraid we, uh, our clock is telling us we are out of time. You've been very gracious. We appreciate that you've been here as long. As you can, I understand you have another meeting. So. Yeah, so. What I'll ask is that we put a semicolon here instead of a period. And you know what? Let me just end uh, by really uh, offering what I think really is a talent branch. Uh, uh, John, when you guys visited Eugene 
before, and I said that we were offering an olive branch, inviting you to come out here. You said, well, I'm not sure that's an olive branch. Well, here's an olive branch. Let's continue the conversation, and then we who live here will finally, for the first time, believe that we aren't just being shut up and suppressed and all of the things that lead to all of our conspiracy theories about the pesticide industry having so much influence through Oregon's for food and shelter and Terry Wynn, Monsanto and those guys. We'll stop believing that if you guys in this room simply will agree to hold a conversation. If you do hold that pesticide, herbicide summit with the government agency reps that we heard you were going to, we heard that it'd be happening this fall. If that really happens, if you could have Stu be a part of that, and if we can uh, see if whether that uh, medical doctor that Oregon Toxics Alliance has brought out here to interface with us on the human condition who could really answer your question, the same way that Stu's an expert in this field, he's an expert in that field, if you guys would be willing simply to continue this conversation with, if you finally believe it's warranted to do what Stu has said that we should do, which is have this study involve these people that he would recommend. If we can do that, then on our end, what we'll do is try to help you to come up with the financing for that. There are nonprofit organizations that we would go to to say, okay, we finally have some government agencies that are willing just to look for the truth, wherever it leads them. We're going to do this study. Will you guys cough up some, some bucks? So it won't be all the taxpayer having to pay for it. So we will contact you. you got to go. But uh, we will contact you afterwards. We will ask if there is going to be that pesticide uh, summit. We will ask if you're willing to have Stu and the doctor be a part of it. And uh, we'll, we'll see where truth takes us. And, and we won't judge you guys as being evil timber company guys. And you can maybe uh, not judge me for being an evil vegan. <laughs> Which I haven't even been in 20 years, even though Terry sent that out to his own family. So, yeah, I'll, okay. I'll, I'll tell you that yeah. uh, the Board of Forestry will continue to focus on this unequivocally because <coughs> intellectual curiosity is probably spurred here today and because of humane interests that we all have on this topic. So, uh, this is, I can just say this has been valuable. You've been a very gracious host. You've arranged a very good tour. I wish all of our tours ran this smoothly. And my and, and clockwork, you did a great job. So, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. All right. This is a great lunch. Thank you. Oh, did you? Cookies, but you have to try it. It's a little bit too much.